Let's get into Pac-12 expansion and talk about the truth on Pac-12 expansion because obviously yesterday was a bombshell. Um, didn't have a lot of time at four in the morning uh, to get as much information as we wanted, but now um, we have had a, an entire day, 24 hours to kind of talk to a lot of sources on this. And there's some interesting color in the background about how this whole thing came together. And one of the biggest questions I think that people have is, why did they do this now? What was it that made the Pac-12 expand with Blasa State, with Fresno State, with Colorado State, and San Diego State now? It seems like odd timing in the middle of September uh, to just make this huge announcement. Well, now we know, according to sources close to the situation in the Pac-12, that Oregon State and Washington State allegedly tried to get membership in the Big 12. They talked to Brett Yormark uh, at length about the possibility of those two programs folding into the Big 12 and ending the existence of the Pac-12. I am told by sources close to the Big 12 that those conversations did indeed happen, but never went anywhere, and they never went anywhere very quickly. Uh, I think that we have talked openly about the value at Oregon State and the value that that athletic brand would have to a Power Five conference, but that door seems to be closed. And I think what really pushed the Pac-12 and really Oregon State and Washington State to make this move, which by multiple sources was called a hostile takeover, of the Mountain West, which I think is very accurate, and I'll get to that in a minute. But what forced the Pac-2 to take this hostile action against the Mountain West was the Big 12 and UConn. Because I think what the Pac-2 learned through the UConn situation was, hey, you just told us, Big 12, that you weren't interested in expanding with us. And then the news that UConn was close and was likely going to join the Big 12 I think really slapped the Pac-2 in the face. And I am told that specifically with Oregon State, they were surprised that those conversations were so advanced, yet the Big 12 wasn't interested in having the same level of seriousness in conversations with the Pac-2. And that really spurred the Pac-2, Oregon State and Washington State, to become much more aggressive and shrink this timeline for their future, because that's really what this was. I don't believe, based on what I've been told by sources, that the Pac-2 all along was looking at the Mountain West as their path to rebuilding the conference. I think, based on what I've been told by sources, it was far more in the plans for the Pac-2 to join a power league, that they, together or separately, would join the ACC, the Big Ten, the SEC, or the Big 12, and go about building their future in that league. But that very quickly came to an end when they attempted to do just that. And the door was slammed. They never got anywhere with the SEC. They never got anywhere with the Big Ten. And it did not seem like, and I, I, I give Scott Barnes a lot of credit for this, the athletic director at Oregon State, who really is one of the, the power players in this whole equation. Scott Barnes, who I've told you on this show, I have an enormous amount of respect for. I covered him when he was at Utah State. That program's gone down since he left as the athletic director. Oregon State has done nothing but rise. It became very clear to Scott Barnes that he had to do something to save the future of his university and, by extension, the future of that conference. And I think this was a very pragmatic move. And it was the only move. And unfortunately, what it does is it puts the Pac-12 in a situation of destroying the Mountain West. You took their biggest brands, their biggest markets, their biggest TV guys. You took the brands that had the most value to TV distribution. And it wasn't by accident. You did that with an effort to rebuild. Now, some of the details behind this. I am told by multiple sources that it is absolutely a hostile takeover of the Mountain West, that the Pac-12 wanted to add UNLV and several other brands in that league but certainly did not have interest in all the brands in that league. And they are currently still negotiating with uh, Gloria Navarez and the rest of the, the leadership of the Mountain West on how to put an end to this situation. Because I am told with a lot of certainty 
that the Pac-12 is going to add more members. And I think it, it specifically people are pointing at UNLV, but that the Pac-12 will add more membership from the Mountain West. It is almost a certainty. How that happens and on what timeline that happens, well, I think that's a very interesting question. But make no mistake about it. This is not the end for the Pac-12. This is the beginning. Because sources close to that situation unequivocally and without waiver told me that they will be at 10 teams, not six and not eight. That they will be at 10 at a minimum is their goal. And they would like to do that within uh, a very short timeline. And their, their plan to do that is to negotiate with the Mountain West uh, on what they can and what they cannot do and how much it's going to cost them. Because they have kind of a handshake agreement that they're going to pause poaching members of the Mountain West while they negotiate what that will look like. Because there is a very large belief, and having talked to college football sources and TV industry sources about this, it's over for the Mountain West. There is no path to sustainability or a future existence without those four members. Certainly without Boise State, who is the crown jewel of that league. Yeah, that that really was a damaging blow. Then you throw Fresno State, uh, Colorado State, and San Diego State into that mix, and you are in a really difficult spot. And if you take UNLV out of that league, and, and the common belief across most of college football is that UNLV will have no choice but to go to the Pac-12 if, in fact, they have not burned that bridge because there is a lot of wondering and head tilting about why UNLV was not in the, the first four of that group. But I am told it's because the Pac-12 agreed to hold off on that. It's not anything to do with whether or not the Pac-12 has a desire to add UNLV because certainly they do. According to my sources, they absolutely want UNLV in the fold. They value Las Vegas as a market. They value the economy in Las Vegas and the revenue stream that Las Vegas can be on multiple fronts, whether that can be your hub, it hosts your tournaments, it hosts your champ conference championship game, whether it is an e-commerce center. They love the fact that there are uh, a number of big time conventions where they can go and sell. Uh, I mean, it, it just has all kinds of possibilities. And when you say, hey, yeah, Las Vegas is the home of the Pac-12. It kind of changes the tone of, well, hey, I'm Brett Yormark. I'm flying in to meet you in Las Vegas. Kind of, it's a different conversation, which brings me to my next point about the Pac-12. The Pac-12 is acutely aware of who they are and where they are. The Pac-12 is not pursuing a power designation. And we had this conversation yesterday, and I think this is a really, really important part of this. Make no mistake about it. If you are not a power, designated power conference, you do not have an automatic qualifier into the college football playoff. And yes, Stuart Mandel pointed out that it does. there is no such thing as a power four conference. That's absolutely true. But do you really believe that, and you can pick your conference champion, Boise State. Let's say Boise State wins that conference in Fresno State is undefeated or has one loss. And that one loss is the conference championship game. Is Fresno State getting in over Old Miss? Is Fresno State getting in over Michigan? What if Michigan doesn't win the Big Ten championship? Well, Monty, got to put Fresno State in. Yeah, actually, we don't. We don't. They're going to get four from the Big Ten. They're going to get four from the SEC. You're going to get one, I would think, one from the ACC and one from the Big 12. So let me ask you this. Do the math on that. That's 10. Two spots left. One goes to the, the, the highest ranked G5 conference champion. Do you really think they're going to put the second highest ranked G5 conference champion in? Do you think they're going to put the next highest ranked G5 football team in? They're not going to do that. Do you think they'll put Notre Dame in? If a one-loss Notre Dame runs the table, do they get in before, again, a Fresno State? What if San Diego State pulls one out of their rectums and has a great season? You think Fres or Do you think San Diego State's getting in over a one-loss Notre Dame team? No, they're not. 
And we can sit here and we can have these cool conversations about, oh, it's neat and the G5 and they have a chance. They don't have a chance. They don't have a chance. And we, we can try to live in this utopic society where we think, oh, well, Monty, there's no such thing as a power designation. It's the top five ranked, you know, uh, conference champions. Okay, well, there's seven spots left. So you have the 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 non-existent power four in the G5. That's five, okay? All those conference champions are in. Do you really think Greg Sankey's giving up any spot he doesn't have to? Look, look at the look at the AP top 25. We've talked about this at length on the show, right? We've talked about this at length. Let me ask you something. Where's the G5 team on this? Oh, oh Northern Illinois. Who thinks Northern Illinois is getting in? Let's say Northern Illinois and Notre Dame are a one-loss team. Notre Dame gets in or Northern Illinois gets in? Notre Dame gets in because of their schedule. As crappy as it is, it's still better than NIU. Right? You you look at look look at the top 10. SEC, SEC, Big 10. SEC, 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 Big 10, Big 10, ACC. Let me ask you this, uh, let's say that uh, Miami wins the ACC championship. Florida State's a one-loss team. We're now a two-loss team. Pick whoever you want in the ACC. Do you think they're getting in over Northern Illinois? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Furthermore, do you think USC, do you think USC's getting in over Northern Illinois? I mean, USC's a one-loss team, Monty, and Northern Illinois beat Notre Dame. Well, so did USC. Furthermore, USC lost to Notre Dame. They're still getting in over Northern Illinois. I, I don't even know why this is an argument. The idea, the idea that Greg Sankey or Tony Petiti or Jim Phillips or Brett Yormark, that they're going to give up any of their money so that we can have Northern Illinois in the, in the college football playoff along with Boise State, you're out of your mind. One G5 team. And in the rarest of occasions, okay, maybe two. Maybe two. That does not mean the PAC or any other G5 has an automatic qualifier unless they are absolutely the highest ranked G5 conference champion. And I will sit here today and tell you for the next two years, I think it is highly unlikely that multiple G5s get in. Highly unlikely. It would have to be a catastrophe on the highest order. The fact that you have Oregon sputtering because who thinks that Oregon is playing great football? Because I don't think any of us do. They're still going to get the benefit of the doubt over any of your garden variety UTSAs, your garden variety South Floridas. That's just the reality of it. And we can sit here and we can we can talk about how great it is that the Pac-12 is back. Oh my God, the storyline. They're not getting an automatic qualifier. They're not. And if they have 10 teams and one of their teams goes undefeated and wins the conference, will they likely be, if that's Oregon State, will be will they be the highest ranked? Potentially. But how do you get past the strength of schedule component? Because there is no bitter, more broken man on Notre Dame football than yours truly, me, this guy. And if Oregon State's a one-loss team, that one loss had better not be to another G5. You'd better find a way to have Oregon on your schedule every year. And you better beat Oregon. And if you lose a game, it better only be to Oregon. Or you're not getting in. And if, if, if you go on and you win your conference, you better hope that you're the highest ranked and Cin Cinderella couldn't find her slipper. Because you are, it, it's just beyond me. It's beyond me that somehow fanboy on Twitter and, and uh, DMs on TikTok yesterday is like, you're wrong. We're getting in. Like the Pac-12 level of intoxication over this story, we're getting in. It's an auto bid. It's not an auto bid. One G5 team. And the proof will be in the pudding, right? And again, I, I just put up the, the likely bracket and I, I ask you here, okay. Do, do the math on this bracket right here. How do you get NIU and Boise State in? 
I don't know either. I don't know. Because I also then go back to, I also go back to the top 25. Look at the 12 best teams. Go down to number 12. NIU or Utah? Okay, well, let's assume, let's assume that somehow, someway, yeah, Oak State is is who James and every other Oak State fan in here says they are. Oak State wins the, the Big 12 championship and, and they beat Utah, who's ranked in the top 12. Northern Illinois or Utah? Uh, I'm going to say Utah. You're getting, the, the ACC already has. What if what if Florida State or Clemson or Georgia Tech somehow wins the ACC championship and Miami is ranked in the top 12? Miami or a second or a second G5 team? You know the answer, bro. It's Miami. It, or it's going to be depth in the Big Ten or the SEC. Because just like the G5, I don't think the Big 12, unless it's an overwhelming case, Right, like I think this is a huge weekend for for K State. They had better beat wholesale ass against Arizona and the Fighting Fafitas. Right, you look at Utah. How about this Cam Rising story yesterday? How about this Cam Rising story yesterday, Coach Prime? Which is amazing to me. Um, that Deion Sanders got duped. And I, I immediately, I think Jake and I talked about this yesterday on the show. There was a fake tweet going around that Cam Rising has tetanus. And the infection's worsened and he's out for the year. And Deion Sanders tweets prayers to Cam Rising. And then somehow figured out that it was a troll that was trolling Utah because Cam Rising doesn't have staff. There's not a massive infection. Cam Rising's being held out because he's got a gash on his hand. He's injured a finger on that cheap shot against Baylor. And yet, you hyenas on Twitter just ran with it. Ran with, oh, poor Cam Rising. Oh, Cam Rising, 76 years old, and he's going to apply for an eighth year of eligibility. And y'all just retweeted it and retweeted it. And then when it t- turned out to be a troll, oh, I knew, it was, I knew it wasn't true. I was just having some fun. You weren't. Because we all love the doom and gloom of Cam Rising in Utah. And it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me how many people root against Cam Rising. And I, I've never understood it. I've never understood it in any way, shape, or form. I've never understood it. I want to. I don't understand it. 